we live in a visual age. The ubiquity and instantaneity of images have changed the world we live in today. And yet, there is a paradox. As never before are we exposed to so many images about politics and violent conflict. And yet, as never before, do we know so relatively little about the meaning, the effect, and the impact of the images themselves. We have yet to grasp what the political dimensions of images mean. And social sciences are only just beginning to shed light into the meaning of images and our visual age. Here at the University of Queensland, two of my colleagues, Emma Hutchison and Roland Bleicher, are amongst a small group of scholars who are spearheading research into the politics and meaning of images. Now, Emma and Roland, you focus in your research predominantly on photographs. Mm. Now, of course, photographs are not the only images out there today. So what is it, in your views, that makes looking at photographs mm. so important? Photographs are not the only images. We have moving images, video, cinema, we have visual performances, we have visual artifacts. So the field of visual politics is very mm. broad. But I think that photographs are particularly interesting and particularly important as well, politically. Um, the famous writer Susan Sontag called mm. photographs visual quotations. Uh, with this mm. she meant that photographs kind of give us a slice of the real, so to speak. They give us the idea we can see mm. a particular place and time just as it is. You know, we can look into a reality back then. Sometimes these photographs become so important that they become iconic, so that they come in some sense to stand for the events themselves. Yes, yeah, so we actually, Roland and I, brought a couple of um, such iconic images with us today. They're very famous images, which I'm sure it, almost everybody would have seen. But perhaps we can just take a moment to talk about what it is about these images that actually makes them so symbolic and so iconic. So, Seb, the first image we brought today is that of the napalm girl. Uh, it's an image of Kim Fook taken by photographer Nick Ut. It is one of the most iconic images, probably the most iconic image of the Vietnam War and probably one of the most iconic images of all time. It's an image that's come to symbolise the horror of the war at that time, uh, which was largely unknown, and also the way in which civilians and children in particular suffered during the Vietnam War. But it was so powerful, it played a massive role in public debate about Vietnam at the time. Some scholars, uh, such as Robert Harriman and John uh, Lucades, even suggest that it was so powerful that it actually helped to stop um, the US involvement in the Vietnam War. And it's also interesting because when it was forwarded on, it, it was actually almost not printed in the paper. It was deemed too graphic at the time and it was not really understood precisely what it was depicting. So we thought to, to illustrate that uh, the role of iconic images, we'll bring a second example along. So we got this one here, which is sort of colloquially called Tank Man. Uh, it depicts the events in Tiananmen Square in Beijing in June 1989. Um, Pro-democracy pro movements were violently suppressed by the Chinese state. And this image has gone around the world and it really has come to stand for a range of things. It has come to stand, of course, for the Tiananmen massacre itself, but also it has come to stand for the confrontation between normal average people and the power of the state. We see visualized one man, small man, focusing a series of tanks. And it's become a very, very, very powerful symbol for democracy, for democracy movements, and for the clash between citizens and authoritarian states. And these are really powerful images. And I mm. guess even if you were born after these events took place, most of us will very likely have seen those images. Yes, you're absolutely right. These are powerful images that have come to depict the events themselves. The Vietnam War, the Chairman Massacre. And I've known young people who were born long after these events, who didn't know these events when they happened, but they know about the Vietnam War, they know about Tiananmen because of these images, because they they have meaning to them. Yes, it's, that's the thing about images, Seb. It's almost like they give us an access 
direct access to the events that they depict. They make us feel like we're there and we can know exactly what's happening. Uh, they seem to perfectly reflect so the social reality that they depict. So in the Tank Man image, we see exactly how the man, as a protester, standing in front of the tanks with his shopping bag, um, it very powerfully represents his resistance. Similarly, in the image of Kim Fook, we see exactly how an American napalm bomb um, inflicted so much suffering on children and civilians in the Vietnam War. So in some sense, what we have here is what the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard called a simulacrum, a perfect representation of reality, a visual representation of reality. And in fact, it's for a long time, it was believed that photojournalists coming back from war would be able to give us authentic insights into the true realities of war. That's really fascinating, that sort of notion that images are objective or that they, in a way, represent what's really happening mm. out there in the world. But in many ways, it's an old and quite antiquated notion too, right? The idea that images could be objective, that they could represent reality, because we now know that photographs are not perfect representations, that are not objective, but that, for example, they can also deceive. Yeah, absolutely right. I think, in fact, what makes photographs so powerful is they give us precisely this illusion of the real, the illusion of access to reality. But in fact, they deceive, they're partial, they're political. There is a range of dimension to them that goes way beyond this perfect simulacrum of reality. So let's look at a couple of examples of how images are partial and political. The first example is that images always need to be interpreted. Uh, we have an image here of the Korean demilitarized zone of the North Korean side of it, of the North Korean flag. I worked in the DMZ a long time ago as a Swiss Army officer in Panmunjom, and in that year, in 1986, there were rumors that the North Korean leader Kim Il Sung had died. This would have been a dramatic event. People expected the collapse of the country and people didn't know what, what was going to happen. The evidence that the South Korean government and the South Korean press gave for the alleged death of Kim Il-sung was images of the flag in Panmunjom, the North Korean flag, flying at half-mast, and thus signifying the death of someone important. The interesting thing is that no one could really observe that. The DMZ is close to civilians. It's, it's a very militarized, demilitarized zone, but we six Swedes and six Swiss, now we, we lived there and we could look at this flag the entire day. It was never at half-mast, except, of course, very briefly in the morning when the flag was hoisted and very mm. briefly in the evening when the flag came down. So it would have been very, very easy to take a photograph of the flag at half-mast, mm. but only the power of the state, the power of the media could imbue this photograph with that type of meaning. So photographs in that sense they deceive, or they're very minimal, they always need to be interpreted. You know, they don't make sense by themselves. They make sense in relation to other photographs, in relation to the kind of uh, knowledge we bring to photographs, in relation to the political events they stand in relationship to. Uh, so they're never authentic in that sense. So we've seen from the Pamuntum picture that images have to be interpreted. They're always political. They always only show us part of the world and not the entire world. But sometimes images uh, deceive us in an even more direct way. Um, our vision isn't always as accurate as we believe it is. And we got another example here. There's a range of, of different examples. Uh, but in this image, we can see um, squares A and B appearing to be entirely different color, almost like black and white. But it's the arrangement of the visuals here that actually deceive us. You know, if we can draw a direct link between A and B, we realize that they're actually the same color. You know? so, so something we perceive to be true, real, authentic, mm -hmm. in fact, can be empirically proven to be actually an illusion, so to speak. OK, so what then is the big takeaway message here? Look, I think the takeaway message is that images are always political. They're always partial. And as students of politics, we have to develop a critical attitude towards images. We can't just take them at face value. We have to ask. What do we see? What's in the picture, but also what is out of the picture? Now, what is it that we don't see? What sort of slice of reality does this picture give us? We have to ask, what are the symbols in it? You know, 
What do they mean? Uh, what kind of baggage do we bring to the interpretation of images? How would other people see these images? People from different cultures, maybe people from different historical periods. So we have to develop a critical way of analyzing images. So now interpreting images, trying to make sense or trying to understand what images mean, is not easy. I mean, there are particular and quite heavy methodological challenges. And one of the challenges that people tend to point towards is that images evoke very strong emotional reactions in us. And so that makes it really difficult to analyze images. Emma, why is that a challenge? You're right, Seb, that images, particularly traumatic images and images of political crisis, are intensely emotional. Emotions are everywhere. It's, it's really impossible to take the emotions out of the image. The images depict and communicate emotions, uh, and we also interpret, uh, interpret the images through the ways we feel. So, for instance, it's impossible to take the emotions out of the Napalm Girl image. Similarly, when you see the protester, the resistance at the Tiananmen Square massacre. And traditionally in, in, in politics, we, ha we're, we haven't been well equipped to study emotions. So emotions, in fact, were seen to be irrational and best left out of political analysis and policy. Um, it was emotions, it was thought, that were actually going to impel people towards harm and not unsound political judgments. Often, in fact, people say women have emotions, um, uh, women are overly emotional and irrational and men aren't. Um, and all of this really is, is very antiquated and silly in today's world, um, in today's world of political science. This is largely because we all know that everybody, everybody feels and it's essentially um, kind of like the way we're socially conditioned to feel influences how we read and interpret images. Um, and, but this is still intensely difficult to study scientifically and through political science methods, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. Yes, I think, Emma, you're absolutely right. I think images work intensely through emotions, and so far we haven't really been equipped to understand that properly. Um, emotions have usually been considered purely private. You know, like, you have emotions, I have emotions, and therefore not really relevant to the public realm. But in fact, emotions are deeply political, they're collective, they're part of how we as, as people make sense of the world. So I think we really need to understand this link between images, emotions and politics. So that's one major challenge. The second major challenge is that images are different from words. And yet somehow we still need words to describe and make sense of images. Absolutely. And I think that's actually a difficult challenge. I mean, Images work differently than words, and that's their very power. You know, that's, that's their influence, because they're not words. They have this visceral, direct impact on us. But of course, as scholars, as students, we still have to make sense of images. We have to still use words to describe them. And this relationship is not easy. Uh, let me give you a very interesting example that comes back to the point that Emma made about emotions. Look at how often on television, on the internet, before a screening of traumatic events, traumatic images, you know, images of dead people, images of injured people, you get a warning that uh, people should be warned that traumatic images follow, you know, if you don't want to view them, you can turn off. Because the images are considered so powerful, so visceral, so emotional that we have to be warned. And yet, when we see verbal descriptions of the very same events, we never get a warning. Uh, the text never says, please be careful, terrible words are going to follow, you might be traumatized. Even though words describe terrible things just as much. But there's something about images that gives us this, this really, really visceral, emotional reaction. And that makes them unique and makes them very, very important to study in the realm of politics. Images are everywhere. They influence our engagement with the world around us. And yet, they are hard to grasp. They deceive, they evoke emotions, and they are different from words. So the question is, how can we analyze images? How can we make sense of the visual dimension of war that we are exposed to day in, day out?